Okay guys, <laughs> this is gonna be an interesting one. It is if you find things like extreme temperatures, high voltage, and radioactive material interesting. If you don't, I don't know, go watch some reality TV or something. Uh, in this episode, we're gonna build a cloud chamber, specifically a Wilson Diffusion cloud chamber. At its absolute basic level, this cloud chamber is a device that was invented in like the 1930s to detect high and low energy ionizing radiation. This includes things like alpha and beta particles, and believe it or not, even antimatter. But we'll get into that. First, let me show you the one we built running so you have some idea what I'm talking about. What you're watching here isn't much more complicated than the vapor trails you see on airplanes. The small silver button is a radioactive source, in this case, americium-241, but we'll get into that later. The streaks coming off are caused by low energy alpha particle radiation. They're causing the atmosphere in the chamber to condense into a vapor that we can see. This is only one type of radiation this thing can see, but we'll go into a ton more detail and examples later in the video. But for now, let's just talk about how this thing actually works. Well, I have a wonderful electronic invention I want you to see. It, it looks something like this. We're going for a sort of retro future aesthetic, but what it looks like isn't as important as how it works, so let's pull it apart. This is the heart of the beast, and let me tell you, it's got a cold, cold heart. See, for this to work, we need to get this black plate down to about minus 30 degrees Celsius, and just about everything else in this device is built to accomplish that goal. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start at the top. This top plate holds a sponge full of 99% isopropyl alcohol. This will become our cloud chamber's atmosphere after we give it some time to evaporate. Next is the cooling element. We're using a series of stacked Peltier coolers, and I could do an entire video on these things, so for those that have never heard of them, they're usually used in things like mini fridges and wine coolers. Hook up power to this little plate, and one side gets hot, the other side gets cold. If you can remove the heat from the hot side, that cold side will get colder and colder, to a point. In our machine, we're using two stacks of four and a stack of five, and if you run them at just the right voltages, you can get things really cold. But all of that comes at a cost. The hot side gets really hot. So to remove that heat, we're using a water cooling system. In this case, out of a computer system, mostly because it looks cool. The aluminum and copper plates help spread and move the heat in the directions we want it to go. The last part of the equation is some good old fashioned high voltage. We create an electrical potential between the alcohol atmosphere and the bottom plate. This helps with a few things. First, it keeps the air free of dust and contaminants, and it also makes the alcohol molecules slightly more polar. This will encourage them to condense when an ionizing particle flies through it. Along with the really cold temperature, the alcohol is right on the verge of becoming a liquid. All it needs now is some ionizing particles. Luckily, this universe is full of them. But before we get into that, let's actually build it.
All right, let's science a little bit about this. Warning, particle physics isn't actually my physics, but I'll do my best. What you see in the cloud chamber isn't radiation itself, but the contrail that the radiation leaves behind in the alcohol. Uh, so if we know what the contrail looks like, we can figure out a few things about what left it. So for example, if we have americium in the chamber, there's a bunch of short, fat trails left behind. Short means they didn't go very far before running out of energy, but the energy must have been pretty significant for it to make such a big trail. Those are called alpha particles, which is a pair of neutrons and protons stuck together. So what americium is doing is making helium. That alone makes me wish I'd kind of gone into particle physics. Where do we get scary sounding americium-241? Well, from a smoke detector, which is a very don't try this at home job, because if you break it, you risk breathing radioactive dust. But you can see why they use it in a smoke detector. The particles only go about an inch in the chamber and maybe three inches in free air. So if something comes between americium and the radiation detector in your smoke detector, like say smoke, it'll block the radiation. That short distance also makes it pretty safe to have in your house. Go figure. There's also these really thin, long tracks that seem to curl off in different directions. The only way that would happen is if the particle was very light for the amount of energy in it, and that would only curl around if it had spin like a top. In our case, the electromagnetic radiation coming off the power supplies are upsetting the particle's spin and sending it off course. Depending on which way they bend, they must either be an electron or its antimatter companion, a positron, aka a beta particle. Positrons, by the way, antimatter, we didn't know that existed until about 1932 when someone saw them in, surprise, a cloud chamber. Physics Girl has a really cool video about that and you should probably go watch it. It's in that one place where we post the links and stuff. Now, I think it's pretty cool to see these radioactive things in a chamber, but the really amazing stuff comes from outside the chamber. So let's take everything out and stuff it away in this cute little lead container so it can't interfere. There's still stuff happening all the time. In fact, oh, holy carp, what was that? Uh, oh right, a muon, which is like an electron, but about 200 times heavier, from outer space. Cosmic rays hit things in their atmosphere and create muons, which only survive about 2 microseconds. Fun fact, at the speed of light, it should take a muon about 50 microseconds to get to sea level where we live. So we shouldn't see any, except that due to time dilation of traveling at near the speed of light, muons don't experience 50 microseconds. Are we having some brain melting fun yet? Good, go check out Cloudy Labs, who has been doing this for years, uh, and Thought Emporium and Electroboom, who both somehow managed to beat us into getting this project out there. These aren't hard to build, but they definitely aren't easy either. We had a lot of people come tell us stories about their own experiences with them at Maker Faire. Um, so if you want to build your own, of course we'll link to plans to them down there. Uh, but also there's a couple things that I think either stop chambers from working or stop them from working well. The first is that everyone focuses on the cold plate temperature. I see minus 25 C quoted all over the place, but I feel the real magic number is probably only about minus 18. That is though, it's the vapor that has to be about minus 18 C. The cold plate is only part of that. You notice we have a little Dallas 18B20 sensor poking up out for that reason. To get the vapor that cold, you'll need to have it hang around over the plate for a little while. So do your best to keep the airflow from coming into the chamber and try to keep the plates nice and level so it doesn't just flow away. High voltage isn't a must, but it does make the chamber more sensitive and makes things easier to see. Obviously, we have to show a few other things that everyone knows to be radioactive, like thorated welding rods and potassium. Uh, you can try a banana for potassium, but you really won't see anything. That's why we went for the concentrated potassium salt. For all you machinists out there, there's a pretty cool piece of metrology equipment that I wish I could get my hands on called a beta thickness gauge. It uses a relatively strong beta radiation source, that's electrons and positrons, to get a very exacting thickness of things like paper by detecting how much the paper blocks the radiation. Let's all play amateur particle physicist for a minute. Uh, we'll show you some cool videos and uh, see if you can tell what you think's going on down in the comments.
I was hoping maybe we could have a little dialogue about that. All right. Uh, Barry asks, on a safety question, is sanding like that on a lathe reasonably safe? Mm, that's a good question. He's referring to when I was sanding a piece of aluminum on the lathe by wrapping the sandpaper around it. The truth is, it is a little dangerous. Uh, Joe Pai, Joe Pizinski, has a really good video on kind of how to mitigate the safety aspect of that. Uh, yeah, link down below. It can be done, it's kind of a necessary evil. Everybody that owns a lathe that I've seen has done it at some point. Yep. But there are riskier ways to do it. So go watch that video and try and be safe. Yep, good question though. Uh, Beach and Board Fan asks, what the hell are you guys making out of copper? <clears throat> yeah. uh, my car asks, uh, did you handwrite the code for brooch? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I didn't handwrite the code. I actually stole it from Cloud42, link in the description. Uh, he does a very similar thing with his uh, little mini CNC, uh, and it works great. Uh, it does repeat actions of uh, whatever step over you have, and he does a whole video on it. Link in the description. Uh, Clint asks, uh, just curious, why are you building the CNC when you have the Tormach 1100? <laughs> well, the truth is we don't have the 1100. Uh, we're kind of borrowing some time on it. That is a whole discussion that we are going to have at some point. Uh, but we wanted one in our own garage, and we didn't have 30 grand to spend, so there you go. Uh, Dwayne says, seeing the lathe is like seeing Bigfoot. <laughs> I guess it's kind of, it's always in the background, to be honest. It's right behind you. Uh, right now, it's actually in a few pieces. A future video, possibly. Cool. Box of Rocks, excellent name. Uh, how did you determine the existing spindle bearings needed to be replaced to handle 8,000 RPM? That's a good question. There, there's actually some general rules when it comes to tapered bearings like that. Uh, but in this particular case, there's a whole wealth of information out there on this particular CNC. Uh, I've been chatting with Arizona Video 99 for a while. He's the guy that supplied us with that awesome CNC kit. Uh, and he's done some experimentation. Also, when we ran it at five or 6,000 RPM, the bearings were getting pretty hot and that's not really what you yeah. want. So easy answer, it got too hot uh, and the specs just really aren't, aren't built for it. So yeah. I do think they said if you got really lucky, you could run one to like five or six, but True. we didn't. Yeah. Nothing was lucky on ours. <laughs> no. Uh, Patrick Wegler says, I like your grease gun. Uh, any information on this? He's talking about this thing. Uh, these are totally awesome. I got it on Amazon. I'll link in the description. I can only find it from China and it took, I don't know, two or three months to show up, but it is well worth it. Mm -hmm. uh, they come with these little reusable uh, canisters that you can fill and the tips are also reusable. I got a whole package of those. They come in a few different sizes. Mm -hmm. And those are called lure lock tips. Um, they also work on these kind of things, which you can get like a hundred of them for super cheap also on Amazon. Nice. Uh, Ryan, it's not me, I promise. Um, can't wait for the tool changer video. Ah, me too. Uh, we're actually working on that right now. Uh, it's gonna be the next video and spoiler alert, it's a good one. All right, uh, RC Dinsmore asks, if you're upgrading to this extent, why didn't you buy a Bridgeport or Bridgeport clone? Um, actually, good question. In this case, we really like the non knee mill setup of the Z axis. Um, otherwise, yeah, you could totally start from a bridge port and still come up with something great. Probably have a better Z axis. I was going to say, I think anyway. the bridge port would be more rigid, especially after getting into this. Um, it's a good option. It is a little more difficult to convert to a CNC, I think. Uh, Joey Rod says, let's wing it. Said, no physicist ever. Good job, though. Yeah, welcome to the channel. Uh, Joel says, not related to this video, but does your Photon upgrade work with the Elegoo Mars? Ooh, uh, yeah, we're, we're looking into that right now, so maybe keep watching. All right, uh, Aaron asks, was that a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy reference? I don't think so. Well, well, anyway, so long. Thanks for all the fish.